There have been some fantastic advances in technology over the last couple of years. Next generation sequencing is getting much of the limelight. And that's because it's allowed accelerated biomarker discovery in a hypothesis-free environment without the need for linkage disequilibrium or association. But the high false positive and false negative rates of next generation sequencing, the variable coverage and the challenges with annotating insertions and deletions has many clinical laboratories concerned. I think we can all see the upside potential of next generation sequencing. That it has the potential to discover novel mutations that you otherwise would not see. But the risk of missing a known actionable mutation is too high. It needs to be run in parallel with orthogonal confirmation techniques and technologies and proven tests for those markers that have therapeutic action. When we move over into clinical samples, there are increased technical and biological challenges. In the area of oncology, in particular, we have the challenge of sample heterogeneity, meaning that we need a highly sensitive and specific technique to overcome the background of normal cells. There is also the challenge in turnaround time. Ideally, we want that to be less than a week and preferably one to two days. The next generation sequencing is fueling the content and we now need mid-density panels on these pure proven technologies. So today I'm going to introduce to you the oncology and translational research workflow on the Sequinom system. We have not been standing still in advances either. We've driven down sensitivity by orders of magnitude. We've improved our software so that you can design your custom panels, your content, rapidly. We've improved our technology for reliability and robustness. So in the Brisbane laboratory that I manage, we are heavily focused, along with our um, brother and sister laboratories in other countries, but we're heavily focused on translating customer content into robust panels and experimental designs that meet the needs of our customer. We don't believe one solution suits all questions. Today I'm going to focus on the area of lung adenocarcinoma and specifically non-small cell lung cancer. We're going to look at some proven examples of panels that we've delivered to our customers in Asia, including, including the Oncocarta and Lung Carta panels, a panel for analysis of able kinase mutations, so slightly move outside of the lung adeno space there for a moment, but also a panel for de ultra-sensitive detection of the EGFR T790M mutation and a panel for EML4 ALK translocation analysis. So the modern paradigm of molecular profiling is to improve anti-cancer treatments in our patients by targeting therapies to patients that are receptive. There's a lot of drugs available that are targeted to specific lesions in specific genes, and there's even more in clinical trials. But cancer is an evasive beast. Acquired resistance means we have a constantly moving target. And there are examples of acquired resistance for a variety of drugs. In the able kinase domain, we've got the T315I mutation, which infers resistance to imatinib, nilotinib, and asatinib. In gastrointestinal tumours, KIT mutation, T670I, infers resistance to imatinib. In EGFR, T790M infers resistance to allotinib. For the EML4 ALK translocations, the C1156Y and the L1196M mutations infer resistance to crizotinib. So it's not a single test at a single point in time. So in the lung adenocarcinoma space, the testing paradigm is now well defined. You start with a KRAS mutation. You'll find KRAS positive mutations in around about 15 to 30% of samples and generally there's a poor outcome. 
Cytotoxic chemotherapy is basically the main option at this point in time. There are some drugs coming through clinical trials that may change that. But then if you're negative for KRAS, you go on to analyse EGFR mutations. In the Caucasian population, we'll find them in around about 10% of the population. In Asia, where I spend most of my time, we find them in 40 to 50%. So it's substantially enriched in Asia. Good news for the Asians, because they respond reasonably well for, to EGFR tyrosine kinase therapy. But either at baseline, at very low frequency, or sometime during the course of therapy, the majority of these will acquire resistance. And the main mechanism for this is the T790M mutation. Ideally, we'd like to detect that mutation as early as possible and quantify it during the course of therapy such that we can determine clinical switchover points. So in the next couple of months, we will be, we will be releasing a focused EGFR KRAS panel, which has higher content than any of the current available panels on the market and also overcomes the challenges of next-gen sequencing in analysing EGFR because they're majority indels. I'm going to talk to you today about a T790M resistance um, assay as well. But if you're negative for EGFR, you then go on to analyse the EML4 ALK translocations. If you have this, these patients respond quite well to ALK tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And I'm not excluding retin ROS translocations, but I'm going to focus on EML4 ALK. We are also working in the retin ROS space as well, but EML4 ALK is better defined for me to present to you today. If you're negative for EML4 ALK, then as Suzanne was talking about, you'd like to maybe do some molecular profiling for allocation to clinical trials. And that is analysing other genes with unclear, unclear um, action such that you can apply these patients to clinical trials or research studies. And that's a further panel that I'm going to talk to you about today, and that is our lung carter panel, which was released just last week. So this is a commonly seen slide. This is the process that a biomarker takes to go from discovery through to validation. Of course, in discovery, we have the challenge that there's small sample sizes that are analysed, and large error rates. So it requires technical, um, technical confirmation to rule out the error rates, and it requires clinical validation to ensure that the marker is actually biologically active. Sequinom works in this space, technical confirmation and validation, and as you heard from the previous speaker, we're moving further into the clinical deployment space. There are different needs at each stage of the process. No one technology can take you from start to finish. And the challenge of today's laboratories is to determine which complementary technologies to deploy to answer the questions you're asking. So therapy has two dynamics, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics is looking at the target what the therapy is targeting. And in this space, we have a series of pharmacokinetic panels. Our Oncocarta and Lungcarta panels are the flagships that I'm going to talk to you about mostly today. Pharmacodynamics is about the passage of the drug through the body, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of that drug, and how long and how effective that drug will be within the body. 90% of drugs work in 30 to 50% of samples. That's a statistic we hear all the time. To me, that sounds fine for a headache. I don't suffer much from headaches, but it sounds fine for a headache. It doesn't sound all that great for cancer. And I think we'd all agree we'd like to improve it. Adverse drug reactions are a leading cause of death globally. So we'd like to look at the ADMI panels to look at how these drugs are being processed by the, bo by the body and how they're affecting the body on a, on, on a global scale. So we have our ADMI toxicology panel. It's a broad panel targeting those most relevant genes in the CYP450 and other drug metabolising genes so that you can look at both pharmacodynamics and pharmacogenetics in your clinical research studies. 
<coughs> I won't talk any more about ADME. There's talks this afternoon at one o'clock which will cover ADME. So, Suzanne, thank you. You did a great job in introducing Onkocarta version one. So Onkocarta version one is a panel of 238 mutations in 19 different oncogenes. When this was developed in 2007, it contained 90% of the druggable targets at the time. And it's still highly relevant today. But many groups wish to diversify the panel, increase the content, decrease the content, and that's where we've been focusing. To increase content, we've augmented this panel with a version 2 add-on and a version 3 add-on to increase the content, but we've also developed panels that are tissue-specific. We have our melanoma panel, which is an 8-reaction panel, looks at 17 genes, 72 mutations. Our colon panel, 7 genes, 32 mutations. Our pancreatic panel, 42 genes, and I have to read this, I can't remember all these panels off my heart. 42 genes, 140 mutations. And our gynecarta panel, which looks at 12 genes and 92 mutations. So Sequinom is not a one-trick, meets-all-needs company. We're developing multiple different panels and also collaborating with our customers to make their own panels. So our lung carta was released just last week and we're very excited about it. We're generating a lot of interest in the market. In fact, in my laboratory, there, have been, there is 900 samples sitting waiting for analysis or waiting for the launch last week for analysis. So we're very busy doing that. Lung cancer is a leading cause of death. One million deaths per annum globally, 1.2 million new cases diagnosed per year, and generally it has a poor outcome because of the late stage of diagnosis and very few treatments available. In 2008, Ding and other authors published in Nature a study on 600 candidate genes using next generation sequencing. They found somatic mutations in 26 genes and they found a thousand different somatic mutations. We have used that, that publication and key opinion leader guidance from across the world to determine the content for our lung carta panel. Our lung carta panel is 26 genes, 214 mutations, and the flyer is on the memory stick, so you don't need to remember this. It's received thorough in-house and field testing. We don't release products until they are thoroughly tested. When we make a commitment of 10% mutation detection, we meet it or better it. It's not an average. So all of these detect 10% mutation detection and we've done thorough testing to prove it. And you can start from 240 nanograms of sample from fresh tissue. With FFPE, I suggest a little bit more and probably 450 nanograms is a good starting point. So in our first field study, we did this up in Japan in the customer laboratory. We analysed 37 FFPE samples and controls and we found mutations in 25 samples with the lung carta panel, a 68% mutation rate. That's generally the rate that we're seeing across various cohorts for these large types of panels, from 40%, as Suzanne described, up to 60 to 70% in some cohorts. So we found those mutations in 10 different genes. We identified all 10 previously known mutations. Of the 36 novel mutations, 15 were high enough in frequency for us to confirm with direct Sanger sequencing. The remainder were below the detection limit of Sanger sequencing and we didn't have sufficient tissue in order to do other techniques or clonal sequencing. So we moved on to the NCI 60 cell lines, where we have plenty of tissue to play, or plenty of DNA to play with. We analysed 38 of the NCI 60 cell lines with the lung carta panel and detected 45 mutations. 36 of these mutations had previously been described in COSMIC. Of the nine novel mutations, we confirmed these with an orthogonal technique, the Illumina Trusi cancer panel. Those that weren't on the Illumina Trusi cancer panel, we confirmed with Onkocarta version one. I mentioned before that resistance is a challenge. Ideally, we want to detect resistance marks as early as possible so that we can guide patient therapy. But previous studies of ultra-sensitive mutation detection have not correlated well to clonal expansion. 
And that's because with allele-specific PCR, you're actually introducing a mutation in order to detect the mutation. It also can detect down to one copy without quantitation. And this is really important. The clinical threshold in a solid tumour will be different to a non-invasive fluid, such as plasma or urine. One copy of a resistance mutation in a solid tumour may be unlikely to clonally expand. One copy detected in plasma may be likely to clonally expand. Sensitivity needs to be coupled with quantitation. The other challenge in clinical tissues is the amount of available sample. So we've done titration studies, and this is a published study from, um, from Beedling, where they've titrated out the amount of genomic DNA in the reaction to look at the, 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 um, the, or the technical sensitivity of the test, going all the way down to 0.3 of a nanogram, 0.3 of a nanogram being 50 cells or 100 copies. And you can see we can get very robust extension even down at 100 copies, with 100% of the assay converted. We can go below 100 copies, but I, I urge severe caution that you'll move into the area of Poseidon noise. But also we want sensitivity. So we can look at, look at a titration of a mutation through the dynamic range. You can see a clear mutation peak all the way down to 7.5% in this particular assay. So the industry believes 7 point, that 5 to 10% is a good range for solid tumours but sometimes you want to go lower. So if we're thinking about plasma analysis, Sequinom knows a lot about plasma analysis because of our work, as Fritz described earlier, in cell-free fetal DNA analysis for aneuploidy. So we know that in a normal, healthy, reproductive age female, in a mill of plasma, there will be 1,400 cell-free copies. And with fetal DNA, you've got generally about 4%, or 60 molecules, so a sensitivity limit of 4% plus or minus 1.3% is what's required. Now, if we apply that theory across to non-invasive cancer analysis. So in cancer, if we assume the same background of 1,400 normal cell-free DNA copies, if we have one copy of a mutation, that would be 0.07%. But of course, if you only have one copy, then you're going to be right in the area of stochastic noise. In half the samples, you'll get one. In half the samples, you won't. So if we bring in stochastic noise, a detection limit of 0.21% is what's required to detect a mutation in plasma in 95% of samples, taking into account that sampling noise. So over the last few years, we've been working on a technique called SABRE, Single Allele Base Extension Reaction. And what we do is we drop out the wild-type nucleotide, such that we can enrich for the detection of the mutant. The first clinical study that we performed was in BCR able in chronic myeloid leukaemia. The group, in, in collaboration with the group at South Australia Pathology down in Adelaide, Australia, we worked with them to develop a 27-plex four-reaction panel for the 27 common mutations in the able kinase domain. We thoroughly um, validated the detection limit of those assays and the detection limit using SABRE goes from 0.05 to 0.5% in those 27 assays. So you can see that's driving us down an order of magnitude. But in fact, we have some Im improvements coming down the line. Our R&D group are working heavily on improving this and it looks like we'll be detecting reliable 0.1% mutation detection. So here's just uh, some example of the data going from 100%, 10%, 1% clearly detectable, 0.5% clearly detectable, and then a flat baseline for 0%. So if we look at the resistance marks in adenocarcinoma, T790M is now well described and well understood. Basically, in this study here that was done on the mass array system, they were able to detect more samples with T790M mutations because of the improved sensitivity, and also show that there's a difference in the survival progression. So we thought, well, that's a very good start, but let's see if we can apply SABRE to it, and we, if, we can, if we can see T790M in plasma. 
So in conjunction with Kinky University up in Japan, we designed a saber assay and analysed 75 plasma samples after EGFR TKI. Using synthetic standards, we were able to confirm the sensitivity limit of the assay was 0.3% mutation detection, and we observed the T790M mutation in 21 of 75 plasma samples. We were able to confirm that mutation by subcloning and sequencing in two-thirds of the samples, so that is 14 of the 21 positives were confirmed. You'll recognise that cloning only 100 clones with a 0.3% sensitivity doesn't go deep enough, but our pockets weren't deep enough to clone a thousand clones. So this is a proof of principle that it's, it's possible to detect T790M in the plasma, but needs further validation really to confirm the robustness of the test. But in this small cohort, we're actually able to see differences in the survival curves with those with T790M mutations in the plasma versus those that don't. So it's a nice proof of principle. The final area that I wanted to talk to you about was EML4 out translocations. And again, working with the group up at Kinki University in Japan, they designed assays to all of the common EML4 out translocations, V1 through to V7. These are single base extension assays amplifying over the breakpoint, over the fusion point. Controls confirmed that they were able to detect all of the assay, or all of the all of the sam, all of the control samples with the the correct translocation. And they, in, in in a clinical study, they were able to to detect variant one in three of the FFPE biopsies and confirm that with fish. We have now been working on an EML4 out panel where we're combining IPLEX genotyping and SABRE dual direction confirmation and we've added in the resistance mutations, so the ALK resistance mutations. And just, la just the week before last I was in Singapore to perform a clinical study on 15 fish positive FFPE samples. We got extremely good validation. We detected more translocations than the current real-time PCR panel because we include the alternative variants and we also detected samples with both a translocation and a resistance mutation with similar frequencies. So again, this is a further panel that we're working on to develop and validate, and we're happy to talk to anyone who's working in this space to help us uh, progress that through. So what do you get with the Sequinom system? You get extremely high quality data. You get quantitation combined with sensitivity, an essential combination. You get precision, accuracy and robustness. Endpoint PCR combined with short amplicons means this works on a variety of tissues, as Suzanne explained. We've focused on somatic mutations today. There are a variety of other applications. This is a toolbox for targeted nucleic analysis across a variety of different biomarker classes. We have software so that you can design your own assays, but we also have an extremely active and skilled for, uh, workforce, support force throughout the globe. Hema we've heard about today, we've got Marion here as well today, and myself from the support field. We work actively with our customers to help you design your panels with your content. And it's a proven technology. It's low cost and high throughput as required for translational research and clinical deployment, and a proven technology with over 1,500 publications in the area of discovery confirmation and deployment of mature panels for screening studies. So I thank you for your attendance today. We do have another lecture at one o'clock, which will again touch on somatic mutation, but also go into ADME toxicology studies. Are there any questions? <laughs>